a fair number of people who do this. And so people who would actually, you know, take this scenario, you don't have a high risk profile, right? And most of us would not take this. We should be disposed to take it because statistically, you know, we should, why not, right? But we don't want to take it because why? Because none of us want to lose $1,000. We all want to make 1000 but none of us want to lose 1000 So it's a, it's a stupid, but it's a stupid little example, but it just goes to the fact that we are not rational in our investment decisions and in our thinking, okay? And that's, it explains to a large extent why things are known as um, um, sort of like, uh, uh, why investing isn't all fundamental in nature, okay? The word's gonna to come to me in a second, okay? Because we do things like, um, we, we use rules of thumb, we use silos, right? Like, I'll always tell you, I, I personally, I'll give a personal example. I personally have investments in four different privately owned companies. Three are real estate funds, and one is a software company. Have you ever heard me talk about a software company? Some of you have had me never talk about it, why? Because I'm going to lose all my money in it. <laughs> Maybe not all of it. I got half of it back, but I think the rest is gone. Why? Because we, we, we talk oh, we always talk about the great returns that we have, but we never talk about the losers that we have. And so like in our mind, we, we aggregate the good things that we do and not the bad ones. And so, you know, there's, there's, there's biases that we use. There's rules of thumbs that we use. Um, you know, we follow crowds, right? You know, that's why, that's why momentum investing is something that people do or don't do, you know, the momentum. You know, one of the, one of the, the, uh, the indicators that people like to use is, is the most recent momentum. Is there a lot of interest in the stock or is there a little interest so we can go long or we can go short? So, and just sort of interesting, I, I wish that, I wish that uh, we could spend more time on it in this class. Uh, but that's probably just a whole class, you know, in, in, into itself. So no, that was Fred, it. I, I came across it. Yes, sir, Frederick. So, so what do you feel about binary options? Uh, uh, binary options, like, give me, talk to me a little bit more about this. What, give me. It, it's like really like Vegas. It's like a yes or no. Right? Okay, like all right. So, okay, so back to the, before I erase it. So there's a difference between investing and gambling, right? Because gambling is a game of chance. And so maybe that's what you're calling a binary option. It's you make it or you lose it, right? right. It's all or nothing, right? right. But, but that's gambling as opposed to investing, which hopefully, again, you know, in a perfect capital market, as rational investors, we can make decisions that can help us obtain a return based on a specific or a given risk profile. So. When we go to Vegas, it's for it's for the thrill, it's for the rush, it's entertainment. It's gambling. By definition, it's gambling. All right? Now, I'm not telling you you can't gamble or that it's not legal. You know, gambling hasn't been legal for a lot of reasons in a lot of places and a lot of times over history. You know, we're in a trend now where gambling's in vogue and it's in vogue because, you know, uh, the operators make so much money that ultimately the states tax it and it just feeds the coffers for 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 the governmental entities, you know, that that that, that permitted. But hey, when I was a kid growing up, you couldn't gamble in Florida. I mean, you, you could go to three race tracks, a couple high life frontons, and the dog tracks, and you could only bet on those specific events that day on on site. You know, and then they started doing simulcasting, and then they started putting tables, and, and now they've gotten rid of the actual events that, you know, for the most part they do, or they, they have tricks around it, right? Like, they close Calder down, and so the Calder runs its meet at, at Gulfstream and doesn't really, you know, have a, you know, physical, you know, venue, so, anyway. Or actually, well, they're, actually they're running it at Calder, but there's no grandstand or anything. It's all signed with that, so anyway. Okay, um, with that, we're going to start presentations. Let's do the presentation. I talked a little bit about, about the presentations today. Okay. We take a quick break. Yeah. A quick break is, is four minutes. I'm going to start when the little thing is eight. The first speaker is, is going to be up. So stretch, get water, do a quick number one. <laughs>
see that in you know, smaller quantities and, and so um, you know potentially it would be like what a private equity firm would do but but on a non-institutional level and it's so it might be friends and family if you want to sort of extend it that way and so does that, does that, does that make sense or? yeah
subject matter, but they are grouped together. So for the most part, they deal with different asset classes. So we've got a presentation on timberland, we've got a presentation on agricultural land, we've got a presentation on, on office, we've got a presentation on retail, we've got a presentation on multifamily. And then we've got a, uh, a presentation on appraisals and, and how they compare with, uh, with uh, with, with actual transactional values. So, uh, the things I, I ask are that uh, you be courteous with the speakers, uh, you know, because uh, I'm sure people deal with you with the same sword that, that you deal with them. Now that said, I, I may take a sharper sword to some of you. <laughs> I, I will ask that you stick to 15 minutes and I'll pull, I'll pull you with 15. If you're less, that's fine. So that we have uh, five minutes to summarize and ask questions. Okay? And with that, and with that, Mariseva, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> this is office. So Maricela's, as she's getting ready up here, Maricela's article, again, some of the material may have been a little bit dated, but it is an article on the U.S. office market. Marisela, you didn't bring a, a zip drive. So you guys are gonna like connect? Does anybody want to go first? And like, I have a, a, a zip drive. 
Does anybody have a zip drive that they want to I have one. No, no, that they have their presentation in it? I have mine, yes. Okay, today. Today, today's presentation is on praise value versus sales price. Uh, praise value versus sales price. Okay, so if you guys can Thanks. maybe pass it around. If you take, put them all on one so that they're all on one and we can just put it, please, that would be great. That would be awesome. Thank you. Intuitively, why would that be? What do appraisers use as information that would create this scenario? Right. Well, I was going to get into that a little bit later, but what they use is three different approaches, like cost approach, um, have it on my slide. Sorry, cost approach, sell approach, and and the cash, cash flows. Yeah, right. I'm like, I have and so and the sales so and so the sales approach would give what? Comparables? Comparables? Right, okay, so, okay, so keep going, market. keep going, keep going. Right, and yeah, I'm going to get into all that. But um, basically, uh, real estate values rose steadily from 1970 to 1905, but according to Webb, that shouldn't have happened because he was saying that in a rising market, appraised values, well, no, in a falling market, appraised values only can um, rise or, or, or exceed the sales <coughs> transaction prices. So, the history of appraisals. Basically, we talked a little bit about this in class last time, about the NACREF um, index. And it's an association of professionals in the real estate industry that publishes research on their area of expertise. And specifically, they get this information from the National Property Index, which is a quarterly report based on the performance of the real estate market. So this was used to form the conclusions about the appraised value um, that both Webb and Fisher came to. Now, I, we talked a little bit about this before, but the appraisal process is in three different steps. The appraisers look at cost approach, income approach, and sales comparison approach. So for cost approach, they look at the input cost of building replacements of the property. Income is the income generated from the property, and then sales comparison is basically what's selling on the market, what's that sales price.
also, I wanted to mention that data is limited on the NACREF index, but basically this tool is used for investors and people to get a general idea of the market and what's happening and how, like what the actual sale prices are. Okay, so I, there was the, the myth, it's called the lagging myth, that, um, that people believe that sales data, I mean that um, appraisal values always lag behind the sales transactions. And personally, when I was looking into real estate, just myself on the residential side, I did always find that, always question it, like why is that? But um, in my trying to answer this question through looking at different journals and research on the commercial side of real estate, I found that um, there was a survey done, and it was a survey of appraisers, and they found that the constant inaccuracy was coming from their lack of correct sales data. Like in a rising market, it's a lot going on, so it's, it's very hard to get accurate data, but the appraisers were saying they felt that if they had access to better resources, and that will enable them to do a better job and give them better accuracy of what's actually happening with the sales prices um, compared to their appraisal prices or appraised values. Um, they also found that there was an education gap for the appraisers because um, the appraisal institute wanted to really find a solution by including more industry training and also trying to enforce more professional ethics and standards into their um, appraisers to ensure that they were doing the best for their jobs and that they were accurately using these approaches and getting you know accurate um, calculations for the actual appraisal prices. So with that, I also found um, something called an engagement ladder. And I feel like this was created to really create a nexus between the client and the appraiser. And what an engagement letter is, is it's something that the client produces to give to the actual appraiser, just kind of letting them know that they know a little bit about the market and that they're an uh, informed consumer and basically try to set standards with the appraiser kind of like to know like this is what I'm looking for to get out of the appraisal. I, I look for a, um, a positive process with you because I feel like sometimes um, the lack of communication comes from where appraisers, they might feel like, oh, well, these people, they don't really understand how we come to this number and they complain or question about like why is this lacking when this is what the market is selling for. But we also have to remember that Appraised, um, appraisals can either increase or decrease the value. Like say if you wanted to add on um, a piece to the property or if like over time the property changes. So these are some factors that you need to, to um, keep in mind. But basically the engagement letter highlights how the client is an informed consumer and knows what's going on in the market and that they're working towards a positive appraisal process with that appraiser. Questions, Carol? Yeah. Who suggested the engagement letter? Was it the author of the article? Yes, it was the author of the article. They said that they had found um, that a company was using this letter and it created better communication, and it kind of let the consumer or the client know like what's to come or I mean they let the appraiser know that they know you know about the market and what's happening. So the consumer is giving it to the appraiser. To the appraiser, right. What about Chad? So I don't know in this I don't know if this is you know, but in my limited experience, I think that if the appraiser tries to, to lower the value, they will they will be in very constant communication with the client. The client will be screaming at them, hey, you know, this is crazy, why are you Lowering the value, look at the numbers and, and, and stuff like that. So I, I don't know how well a, a letter does because the only time they don't get a letter is when the appraiser is raising the value. 
if they're lower in the value, they're definitely going to be less in communication. Typically, just to pipe in, typically professional relationships are governed by engagement letters, whether it's a, an accountant, a client, an engineer, and a client, an attorney, and a client. It's essentially the contract that establishes the, 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 the conditions, right, under which the service is being provided. And so it makes ample sense in the context of an appraisal that a client and, and an appraiser have an understanding of what the expected result is going to be, what the compensation is going to be, what the deliverable is going to be, right, and what the level of interaction and communication is going to be. So. Yeah, and I think that that's, like, key for starting that, you know, partnership and yeah. just setting the standards. A absolutely. Right, and I found that that could be a solution as to the gap between the actual education and what the consumer knows about appraisal. One second, Stephen. Noah was first. Um, do we have any appraisers in here? Do we have, we've had before. Because um, I was always told we're not allowed to uh, influence them. Well, You're paying them. How can you not influence them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, yeah, I thought the okay. same thing. I thought so, the yeah, other. I think the USPAP says you can't influence them towards a value conclusion. Yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. <laughs> I took an appraisal class last year. That's definitely. Yeah. The owner knows more about the company. Okay, but you guys, hold on. Did, didn't you see that movie Back to School? Like with Rodney Dangerfield, this guy was like, oh, when you manufacture widgets, and he's like, what's a, what's a widget, you know? And it's like, so many. Look, there's like theory and there's practice. Why do we have an appraisal? That's one of the things. Why do we, why do we hire an appraiser? That's the main Independent. Value. Independent. For for a loan, if you just want to okay. say it. Okay, oh. let's, let's be pragmatic. There are two reasons in real estate why you hire an appraiser. Obviously, you hire an appraiser to establish value, but for, for two reasons. In the context of that, it's so you can borrow money. And what you're looking for is a lender that feels comfortable that there is value, that there is collateral to support their debt. Okay, that's number one. In the context of NACREF or any other private equity, and this is really important, why does NACREF do appraisals? Because at the end of the day, people are long, these NACREF, these, these fiduciaries are long-term holders of real estate. What is their compensation based on? In part, value creation. How is value creation determined? By increases of value. How are increases of value determined? By appraisals that are done. So, so th there's arguments, and I'm not gonna, we'll, we'll talk later today about the differences between publicly owned and privately owned real estate in a return profile, but there's an argument that there is a smoothing in a large institutional privately owned you know, arena because appraisals formulate you know, part of that return profile. And appraisals, as we're being told here now, may or may not be indicative of true value today, right? So in rising markets, there is a lag. Why? Because when we use sales data, the base mark or the baseline or benchmark, a value or estimate a value, if markets are rising, we're using historical data that's lower than where the market's gone. And in, and in declining markets, what's happening? The opposite. We've, we're using historical data that's, that's higher. So, so appraisals are going to miss the mark, right? So they're going to be higher than what sales values are going to be. Okay, And that's what the whole article was just trying to talk to, the fact that in rapidly moving markets, there may be a lag between what the value establishes in an appraisal and what what uh, what may actually transact. And to your point on influencing an appraiser, ultimately an appraiser obtains information from you, right? So if you are the client, whether ultimately the bank is the client and you're just paying the guy, but the appraiser is working for the bank. Ultimately, you're providing all the property-specific data, and you're looking for a number. And so I don't know what the textbooks or the college professors tell you, uh, you know, or what the institute of whatever tells you. I'm just telling you, you're paying the guy. He better come up with a value. You're going to fire him. <laughs> no, it's not like that, okay? It's not like that. It's an opinion about it. I was selling real estate uh, before the crash. And I had a property that appraised maybe let's say for two hundred, and we were under contract for two fifty. Um, the other realtor said, "Don't worry, I have an appraiser that'll fix it." 
So these engagement, I mean, it's like the wild, well, wild west right. here. So, so I mean, but again, there's been, right. I mean, I would say the yeah. MAI, the Master Appraiser Institute, really stands for made as instructed. But I'm, <laughs> listen, I'm not trying, I'm not trying in any way to, I've had appraisers in class. In fact, guys who are appraisers tend to be very good professionals in the development arena because they understand value. Was and, Dylan an appraiser? Well, I mean, Dylan was a Bitcoin trader. <laughs> you know, I, I think he had an appraisal background, you know, but, but anyway, look, I think we need to move on. Well, uh, yes, Tula. Okay, what about complicated commercial appraisals? When they take into consideration highest and best use, right. and the highest and best use, like for example, the 1700 Biscayne building we did on a previous class, they were asking 85 million, and we found it wasn't even worth right. 16. Well, so but uh, appraisers. So what appraisers that? Well, appraisers can do you know what if scenarios, and they can they can speculate on or provide an opinion on what the value might be if if the zoning were different, if the use was different. Okay, so I mean it can be a very complicated process, right? You may not change the use, but reposition. And create a different revenue stream and project different value. Okay, so you know ultimately it is a professional in the industry who is helping lenders and investors get an idea of what value is or could be given certain you know considerations or parameters. Yeah, no, maybe. So what's the recourse if you don't like the appraisal uh, and you request an appraisal review? Well, listen. The, 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 uh, so going back to why do you use an appraisal to establish value? Why do you establish value? Well, because you need a loan or because you're trying to get paid, right? Um, typically, when you've got, say, put call uh, provisions and agreements, <coughs> real estate has a lot of joint ventures associated with them. So a lot of times one guy wants out. Well, how do you value an illiquid asset that, you know, you know isn't even on the market? So a lot of times we rely on appraisers, and what happens is, you know, some of the some of the arbitration um, 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 language that I've seen typically, if you don't like one appraisal, then you hire three, and you know you take the middle one or you take a blend of the three. So there's a lot of different ways that you can work around it. Pragmatically, if you are trying to get a loan and you hire an appraiser and the value doesn't come in. The bank's not going to make the loan, or they're going to make the loan for a lower value, and you got to come up with more equity. That's the pragmatic, you know, answer. Yes, and this is the last one because we got to move on. The, the next person, yes. whoever's going next, start setting up while we're wrapping up. Let's go. Brandon, go. go, go. Yeah, I, I was just reflecting that in a real-world scenario, the bank seemed to control what the appraisal report is going to be more so than the owner of the property. And typically, you guys listen. Guys listen. And typically, the bank pays the appraiser. So uh, the bank never pays the appraiser. The, 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 the bank may pay the appraisal, but you, but pay you got the a rip. Exactly. That's so my they, point. Well, so so that changes the reporting lines and there, there, there and, was, and the loyalty. I think this goes back to the 70s, in which uh, because of abuses. Um, as it related to appraisals that were used for loans, that the banks were required to engage the appraiser. It used to be, I don't know when I was younger, it used to be that the banks would provide a list of approved appraisers, and it sort of gravitated from that to they actually engage the appraiser. Okay? Anything else on appraisal? That being said, Brandon, retail and real estate. Okay. Good morning, class. Um, my topic was retail and real estate. Uh, okay, my article was by Stephen M. Coyle. Uh, in the article, it was a little bit dated. It was back in uh, 1995. Uh, he kind of spoke about the drivers, which are still similar drivers right now. Uh, and he also spoke about the different retail formats as big box stores, value retailers, supermarkets. Um, and right here, I just put a picture of kind of like the the retail format that's looking at the future. Uh, street front, street front facing stores, a very urban downtown feel that I'll discuss later. Okay, so I made this chart. Um, what stimulates retail growth? 
Uh, when we look at the economy as a whole, uh, we look at when our when employment when the employment rate um, starts going up. Uh, we see we see that the housing market starts going into recovery with a lag of retail recovery, and and um, then you see an increase in disposable income uh, per household, uh, which results into higher consumer spending, which promotes retail growth, but then goes back in a circle and there's higher employment levels because of more retail. So let's just go back for a second. If okay. that's the case, why why do we, we ever go counterclockwise on that paradigm? It can. It, that's why I just that's why I just left it as yeah. as a cycle. What do you mean? Is it if yeah? Like, so how if it's always growth? going clockwise? How do we ever get into lower? Yeah, I guess I should have put I could have put arrows going back because yeah. each one of those can I guess stimulate another. It's not just it does not it doesn't have to be that higher employment, raised housing recovery, which increases disposable income. It can go it can go either either or. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the consumer, uh, the consumer confidence index. It uh, measures the degree of optimism, how much, how healthy uh, the consumer is, how they feel that they can spend their money right now and not save for the future. Um, in that crash in 2007, in the recession, most people, their disposable income, they was very, very low. Uh, most of their income that was coming in, they were looking up to the future and saving any penny that they possibly could. So they weren't really going to retail stores. They weren't spending the, that kind of. They weren't spending that kind of money. Um, the consumer sentiment measures the overall financial health. The consumer debt is how much the consumer plans on saving. Um, in a in a healthy economy, people spend more, and they worry about uh, saving less for the future. Like I but, said, Brandon, just walk us really quickly. I mean. Go to the top chart. What's the blue? Oh, red I was going to talk about the chart in a second. Okay. Okay. The chart. Okay. In in green, you see the consumer confidence index. With the red and blue, you see uh, the the index value and the, and the index volume for sales. You see as the consumer confidence increases and decreases, you see sales are also increasing and decreasing. And and talking to real estate, how does that affect real estate? Uh, it affects real estate by it affects real estate by when it increases and decreases. There's there's less people going to retail stores, which means there's less retail yeah, but stores. Where, where where's the relationship between rents, occupancy, and retail consumption? Between between that? Yeah, I mean, I, this is a class in real estate. It's not a class on. Yeah, yeah, on yeah. Retail. I know, I know. But what I'm saying is, when consumers aren't going to retail stores, retail stores are going out of business. Which means then the investor that has his money into the real estate, the real estate stores, they who's going and, and there? No, we, if no consumers. Do we have that anywhere? I was going to talk about it. Okay, I, was, right, I just okay. had little points, and I have. Okay, all right. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, when when consumers when consumers aren't going to retail stores, when re, when consumers aren't going to retail outlets, those retail outlets go out of business. Which then the investor that has all those retail properties, he has nobody occupying that space. Um, and the chart underneath? Uh, the chart underneath that is the um, that is the connection with employment rate and that is the the chart with employment rate and poor sales. And what so, does poor sales mean? Poor sales. Uh, when employment rate is down, people aren't spending as much, so retail sales are all down. If you see when when sales are going down, you see unemployment rate is also going down. That's brought by the National Council of Real Estate Investment uh, fiduciaries. Yeah, I, I, I understand that the the, the 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 Y bar on the left is unemployment rate, but I don't understand what the one on the right is. Yeah, the one on the left that's that's sales, like retail sales. In in in, in what? In, is that currency? What is that? That is, and well, that's in millions in retail sales. Millions. Better be more than millions. Okay, move on. Okay, uh, David Zurich is an economist. Uh, 
This theory, tightening labor market will continue to increase overall disposable income per household and in turn uh, increase re retail sales. Job growth combined with upward progression in consumer sentiment will increase demand for retail, retail space for years ahead. Okay, now I'm going to go kind of into the demographics. Um, what areas are in demand? <coughs> Who's the target market? Investors have to look and look at demographics and see and see where their target market is. Um, right now, we see the change, the influence of the the retail format. Uh, millennials like to see the more urbanized uh, downtown feel, and that's kind of what is controlling uh, the retail sector right now. Um, also, right now the the uh, the parents, which is Generation X, from the ages of 46 to 55, they're in their peak spending years. So even though that they're in their peak spending years and, and, and uh, retailers are looking at them and investors are looking at them to see where, uh, where the most money is gonna be spent, it's them. But all the changes that are coming to the retail sector, they're looking at the millennials because that's gonna be in the next, in the next five or 10 years, uh, that's like the future. Okay, uh, vacancy. Um, as you see when vacancy rates drop, of course, uh, growth goes up. Vacancy rates have fallen to 7.3%. Uh, retail vacancies have fallen 7.3% according to the National Council of Real Estate Investment Fiduciaries. Um, you also see a lot of rising NOIs. Okay, well, let, 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 let's go back to, I mean, What's critical here at the end of the day is, is if you own real estate, you care about two things, occupancy and rental rates, right? Because ultimately that's what's going to determine what your income is going to be. Yeah. So we've talked about, when occupancy. let me, hear me out. We've talked about intuitive things that we think drive retailing. My question is how do, how do those factors that impact retailing affect rents? and affect occupancy. I see vacancy rates here. I don't see rents anywhere. Yeah, well, I mean, vacancy, I get, I get uh, when vacancy rates go down, you, of course, occupancy is going up. Uh, I know I didn't put, I didn't put occupancy I understand that, there. but rents, rents is what drives your net income. Yeah, rents would drive my income. And when vacancy rates are down and occupancy is up, you see rent growth is, all, is increasing, okay. going up. Where, where is that? Vacancy rates are going down. Rent I understand, but where's where's it empirically supported? I guess I didn't empirically support yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Keep going. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little wrong. No, listen. This is an exercise. No, it's good. Going. No, no, no. This it's is good. This is an exercise. I mean, okay. you're going to make presentations, and, and clients are going to ask you questions. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, the, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, as far as all the new construction of retail that's going on, you can see in 2007, of course, it dropped. Um, with all the new construction and and new retail starting back up in 2013, 2014, um, the absorption rates are still pretty high. Uh, Everything is with the absorption rates high. It's still increasing the the rent, rental rates. It's not like there's there's too much vacancy. There's too much construction that's going on where building where retail buildings are just sitting empty. Um, the cap rate is also uh, decreasing for for uh, for uh, retail rentals. Okay, now I'm going to go into uh, the retail format. Uh, Back then, when I was, the article discussed how big big box stores and value retailers and, and we're gonna we're gonna control the entire the entire retail sector. Um, as far as right now, uh, investors are looking at retail to build retail with much smaller stores, much smaller stores because they can they can put this retail into into areas that they couldn't put a big box store. You can't put a big box store in a downtown dense area. They're looking at they're looking at smaller stores, smaller smaller footprints, um, 
but do, we have, in, do we have some examples of those? Well, uh, if, if you look right here, I don't know if you guys have been by like a, a Tesla store. They can put a Tesla store in a, in a high dense area with one car inside the store and then a computer where you could just literally just build your own car. You couldn't put a whole dealership in, in a high dense downtown area, which is, there's so many people that are walking by the Tesla store and seeing the car and seeing, I mean, I'm sure you guys have just seen like cars just sitting at malls, but it's not the same thing as having a store and having, having the capability of building your own, your own car, like, like at the mall, like, like you're shopping. Um, back in the, in the article, back in the nineties, they, they said internet would control they, a huge portion of the market, which it does, but it still only contributes to 5%, which I feel is pretty small compared to the entire retail sector. Um, a lot of the online stores that are just online are now are starting to move to to actual physical stores, which there's this moving movement going from clicks to bricks, um, and that's increasing online stores uh, that you now see that are in uh, in physical format. Um, okay, uh, in the last ten years, we've had multi-channel, which is giving the option to, to purchase your goods online or purchase your goods in store. Uh, now there's, this, there's a new thing called Omnichannel. Um, it, gives, it gives retailers a smooth shopping experience by allowing, allowing the consumer to purchase their goods on any different type of format. Um, you, can, you can, on social media, on websites, on Literally on, on any anywhere where you want, they want to give the consumer the option to to purchase uh, to purchase retail at any any different format. Um, they realized that that online and in store wasn't enough because because convenience convenience is the king. Um, consumers expect integrated omni experience. Yet today's real estate only only supports um, solo driven delivery models. <coughs> Um, changing the face of retail. Uh, like I said before, the downtown is back. Uh, in the article, they kind of just didn't really, didn't really, uh, I guess, predict any of this. They were predicting more as in big box retailers and those kind that are actually now decreasing, and and investors and developers aren't building those aren't building those shopping centers as often as they used to be. Um, yeah, P. They want street. They want street-facing storefronts, like an outdoor <laughs> field, entertainment. Um, so yeah, they're looking to reinvent the basic landscape. They're using technology and different amenities to do this. They're also so they can be in uh, higher density areas. They're they're going up, so the malls are going to be three or four stories rather than than one story that has to take up a lot bigger bigger area. There are my references. Any questions? I'm free to. I, I also want to note my article, uh, it spoke a paragraph about drivers and then 15 pages about, about different retail formats as it spoke two pages about big box, it spoke two pages about supermarkets, it, spoke two, it wrote two pages on, on drug stores. Um, First of all, thank you for being a good sport, but everybody else is going to get their medicine as well. <laughs> Listen, um, and this is going to be a challenge for, come, you can come up and start. Yeah, if anybody else needs to, their presentation on the oh, drive, just let me know because I'm not going to now. Does anybody else need to put their presentation on, on a zip drive? Steven, you had a question. No, it's more of a comment. Um, kind of the way, uh, I guess, the future retail is going, I have seen those examples like the Tesla store, for example. Yeah. I found that kind of interesting that you go into the shop and look at the, the way the frame is and kind of this way you be able to have seen other retailers kind of cater to that. Well, just to bounce off that, Tesla is a complete custom car. You, you, they don't actually have dealerships. They make your car as you want So, that so would it's be not right. It's, so, it's, so it's it's a custom manufacturing right? Right? Any other, yeah. environment, any so it's, it's not process-driven <clears throat> like the traditional car yeah. manufacturer. 
so so the, the challenge here, the challenge in the class, and I'm going to single you out, you know, but it's really across the board. Um, we have an opportunity with these articles to dig beyond what we think and believe and to prove it. That's the, the point of my you know, question. So if we chart sales, is there a correlation between sales and occupancy or rents? Is there a correlation between GDP and rents? And all that information is there. Yeah, it's yeah. Available. So we could say, and you, you tried to address some of the questions that I posed to you. For example, yeah, the downtowns are back. So my question is, is how many square feet of retail are there in CBDs now versus 20 years ago? We, we think they're back, but is that a fact? Do we know that? And, yeah, I mean, no, no, no. You know, and, and it, I, I mean, I, want, I don't want what I think. I asked you for examples. I've seen that Best Buy has reduced their footprint, that Staples talks about reducing their footprint. What's the impact of that on occupancy? Because I will tell you this. I see, I see the impact being more they can go into areas where they weren't allowed to go. I, I, but I, I don't want feeling. I want numbers. I want to develop. I want to play in this asset class, right? So it's not what I think. It's what the facts tell me. So here's what the facts tell me, which is what I don't understand. In 2007, 2008, rents went, I mean, retail sales went way down. Retail sales per square foot went way, way down, yet retail rents went up. Why is that? Because they had to cover their losses. We didn't have to cover their losses. They, nobody was, nobody was in any of the, nobody was uh, occupying but any of the space. People, they people had people raised the price for the people that actually were. Well, wow, but how long, <coughs> how long, how long are leases? I mean, you don't just do that, you know, one day or another. I mean, my, my, interpretation is that leases in retail spaces have very long term tenures <coughs> and so leases that were in place from the late 70s early 80s that had 20-year leases with 10-year because you talked about for example drugstores and all that hey but go to a mall when you take the accounting class those of you taking the accounting class and you look at the lease roll right you know sears or macy's will go into a mall and do a 30-year lease with five and ten year you know options so when things are expiring today, regardless of the environment, they were so far below market that the little research I've done is that <coughs> rents really are independent to retail and employment. At least that's been the issue now. And issues like the internet haven't affected, you know, you, speak, you say 5% of sales. I don't know. I didn't see substantiation for that in the paper. And again, I'm not trying to beat you mm -hmm. as opposed to anybody else who maybe had similar issues in their asset classes, but if in fact the internet only accounts for 5% of all retail sales, and I don't know if it does, I, I don't know. Um, has that had an impact on rents? I don't think it has. In any of the subclasses that the article talked about. So, you know, is, is this asset class bulletproof? My article didn't t talk about it. I, I understand that, but the challenge was to update what- Yeah, 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 I get so, that. My article literally talked about different but, retailers. Okay, but don't get defensive. Your article, the instructions on the article were to, to the extent that the information was dated, to bring it to today. Yeah, yeah, that's what I tried doing. I tried putting a connection between unemployment rate and, and consumer spending, which which there I found I found that I found okay, evidence. We can talk that. about we can talk about your specific paper afterwards. Stay. You know there are provisions on what the rental rate might be at that point. You know from a lender, from a a, a uh, landlord perspective, typically you're going to grant extensions based upon prevailing market rates at the point. If you're the tenant, you're going to try to fix it to something that's more favorable to you. Okay. So, but those are all parts of negotiation between landlord and uh, and tenants. Will you say that the, the, the tenant has more leverage? Well, that depends if it's a tenant market, if it's a tenant market or a landlord market. So there are times in which, so that's why 
when we look at charts that have things like construction, when we look at absorption, when we look at vacancy or occupancy factors, it helps us to determine who's got more leverage in a particular environment. In 2008, if you owned industrial space in Dade County to say something, you know, uh, um, the landlords have very little leverage. Rents drop 25, 30%. Um, there's an article, Maricela standing up, there's an article that I'm going to um, bring up at the end of our presentation when we talk about offices. In today's environment, because there's been such little office, CBD office construction over the last seven, eight, nine, ten years, there's very little large contiguous blocks of space. Law firms looking to expand, law firms looking to renew, law firms looking to change their venue are finding difficulties right now because there isn't the contiguous space built. So that's here South Road. No, no, that's national. That's national. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the office market. Marcelo, how many slides do you have? You have 15 minutes. Okay. Starting right now. I 18 slides. I said three or four. Those were the instructions. Yeah, but I have my support slides with me. If you ask you, any you, questions. You have 14 minutes and 30 seconds. Marcella, one quick, one, quick, one quick question on the previous slide. The rental rate you quote of 30.11 to 30.59, is that triple net? Is that full service? And is that a blend between CBDs and suburbs? It's a blend. It's a blend between CBDs and suburbs. And listen, I didn't write it there. I have it on my support slide. And is that, and is that a, and is that a, a, a. 2.4. Uh, uh, is that a triple net or a full service rate? Full service rate. Um, okay, we've, uh, if we go back to how uh, this um, uh, office space itself evolved, uh, from the design of the offices, from you know the big front floor plate uh, with uh, everything in the middle, all the services and the office space around that floor plate to what we have today, um, we've seen that the, the 
we started like the garage phase. It's like Apple. Uh, it went through. A, uh, everybody went through their garage for an office space. Then it went uh, evolving to a legitimate, uh, legitimate work environment, and, and some offices, um, some companies offer this type of space, like Regus. And um, we've, now we are in a different environment for this class A type of uh, office, which I did call on my paper like a, a privileged or different uh, class A, because it's a, it's a, a class within the class. Um, why? Well, uh, co-working is on style now. In co-working, everybody wants to share the space and to go to a hip place to work. Uh, the concept of working on a close environment uh, where you had a cubicle is completely out. Companies, uh, corporations are seeking the, the downtown offices uh, because of a, a lot of uh, factors. Two of them, um, demographics, and the other one, uh, something got, that uh, I read that I thought it was interesting was uh, psychometrics. Demographics has to do with the geography and the age group and the income. And the psychometrics is mostly what people are thinking. Why do you want to uh, go to, to uh, close to downtown? There are two demographic groups actually moving to downtown, and that's given an increase not only on, on retail for the downtown areas, as Byron was explaining, but also in the office spaces. Um, the baby boomers are going to be closer to the downtown areas and, and uh, just because they're closer to services or the grandkids or whatever reasons. And uh, the millennials want to be there because the work, live, co-working, co-sharing spaces and, and trends an idea of having live and work and play at the same area. Um, what drives millennials to go to the downtown? Well, there are different theories about, you know, they're still paying for the work, for the student loans or they they want a different lifestyle, whatever it is, they are doing it. And uh, since we know for a fact that um, technology companies are the ones that hire the most millennials and, and they're the ones actually driving this market, uh, we try to move as fast as they can. <laughs> we, we evolved from the traditional office space design to uh, <coughs> what uh, we have today as uh, the new office spaces. Uh, technology companies have been the trendsetters in the design of the, the like the Googles, <laughs> where they uh, you feel like you want to go to the to the working um, to the working space, and um, we see who offers uh, flexible spaces now uh, for the co-working and co-sharing or, or however you want to call it. Uh, there are corporations, usually the the the, the uh, traditional landlords like Boston Properties and Regus. And the new companies, the new startups like WeWork, and um, we have uh, uh, Next Space or Tech Space. A uh, high percentage of these, these um, uh, companies are local, but we do have the bigger ones like uh, WeWork, which is all over the world, and, and Next Space that had locations in, in different parts of the world. Now we wonder what new tr these new trends are. Uh, what's the impact of this new moving into downtown? When it, it, we know it's more expensive, uh, we know the rental it's more expensive both to lease and to rent. Uh, with new trends, uh, we have uh, new requirements for building, new requirements for for being good or feeling well. Uh, and I I pointed at this new uh, lead uh, kind of uh, cousin. Which is, which is called well, that addresses the well-being of the person. So you need to go to a, a working environment and you have to have, um, um, they call them hydration stations in certain, uh, you know, certain distances and you have to breathe uh, quality, good air, good air quality and you have to have certain things. This is um, part of the amenities that, that I spoke about a little bit on the, on the classification of the uh, offices where these new companies are offering different amenities than the usual uh, corporations offered as a, to, to be classified as A, because to be classified as class A office, you have to have certain amenities. These new offices, um, I mean, startups are offering things like uh, healthcare, um, payment services, uh, not the amenities that the, the old or traditional offices, uh, class A uh, spaces offered, uh, the amenities were like, a, probably a concierge service or a conference, a nicer conference room. Or, so we're seeing that, that uh, in this market, 
we don't know where all this uh, new trend is going to end up at, in terms of costs. It's costing more to set up a class A space today because of the amenities required by millennials. Um, How much more? It is. It depends on the amenity. Okay, if you want healthcare, because it has upper, the the numbers are not there yet because you can't compare today apples and apples. That there is no transparency on the on the on the startups. So we don't know that. We know the numbers from Buster Properties. We know the numbers from Reviews because they're public companies. But the the even the valuation of these companies, we don't even know uh, if they're real. Uh, we can actually see what Boston Property owns and what they have. We look into the uh, their information because they're public. But these new companies, for instance, uh, uh, the the WeWork was valued in ten billion dollars last year. And where do we get the numbers? I I couldn't find out. Okay. Uh, when Boston Properties is a company valued in 19.6 million dollars, so it's a uh, billion dollars. So, how do you how do you actually compare, you know, a public company with uh, one of these companies where you can't get the information from? Um, so um, we have, you know, and, and and the challenges with this Type A class new asset or whatever you want to call it, trophy. What I read somewhere that it was called trophy asset in the class A spaces is what will happen with this, especially in the CBDs, in the, in the main markets. With all this new amenities, how much, how much more is it going to cost you uh, to rent a space which started up to be like a flexible, cheaper, more accessible uh, space for millennials? And we have to take into account that millennials would be the driving force, probably over 40% of the working force by year 2020, which is you know only six years away. So, and, and we have to see that companies and corporations are trying to follow the talent and, and be closer to the intellectual capital, closer to downtowns. Um, how they interacting also, we've uh, read that, that um, we were uh, rented a space from Boston Properties uh, uh, in the New York, in Brooklyn, that the third of the space was rented by WeWork. So uh, the interaction between the, the, the traditional companies and the new com uh, players in the, in the game is going to be something interesting to, to watch. Um, the, the, um, and uh, how will also public companies like Boston Property and Regus will adapt to this type of market? We've seen some interaction and there are so many other questions. This is a, a, a market that I didn't know a lot about, but uh, I found out a lot of information that still um, not include in my <laughs> presentation, but uh, I, I wonder, um, like uh, all these leaks and wells, and, and people wanted to, to be how much more is going to add. We know six percent is added to our lead construction cost. How much more a well certification is going to cost? Do you want CBRE just opened up their headquarters? It's going to is the first uh, well certified building for CBRE, and CBRE has been known to be. Um, like a trendsetter when they started with lead like uh, eight years ago, so people wanted to rent lead spaces and go directly to CBRE. What's going to happen? It'll be interesting to watch. Maricela, what is what is the cost of? You, you quoted traditional, and you gave a blended rate between CBD and suburban space at thirty dollars a square foot, and, and and it's a tale of two worlds because. Suburban office is closer to the mid twenties, and CBD is, so you know, for, 60s forties on, forties <laughs> on up, depending on where you are. But so you use a blended number of thirty dollars a square foot. What is the cost to rent a, a shared office space per square foot? It depends on what you want, and that's one of the metrics that I, that I was wondering. What are we going to? How are we going to determine, for instance? <laughs> <laughs> Answer my question. What is hundred dollars? If I want to go to WeWork, I, I could pay a hundred dollars. Is, is that a, is that you know that? Yeah. I okay. And what does Regis cost? <laughs> cost uh, depends on the space. They calculate your space as uh, one person per two hundred square feet, as as okay. your metrics okay. give what? you. And but now probably we're gonna hard to you know change even the metrics. You know, uh, seat or I, I just, occupied space by. You know, I'm an accountant by training, and what I'm struggling with all the ideas is, and I read your paper, is there is definitely an evolution in the way we work. But I'm trying to get to how do I quantify that? And as an investor in real estate, how do I play in that? 
It's uh, I, I, I've talked to to two of uh, people from from WeWork and. Um, they have the maximum occupancy of the space in the way they design, and then since they calculate 30% of that population that, that it's gonna come into the office are not gonna be there from nine to five or from eight to six, so they add that, so they actually value their space in 130% of the low, uh, legal occupancy space. How do they add up to their metrics and how do they calculate how many people are gonna come in? I, I uh, wasn't able to find the answer, but uh, it's different. Before, you, you calculated 250 square feet per person. That goes into your rental square, and, and, and I mean, there's dollars per square feet, and, and how many people can I fit here? And you as a corporation, when you want to rent, and you, or a bank, and we're like, okay, I need four tailors, five uh, managers, and so I need this much space. How do you go now when you're gonna rent a space as a, as a company? American Express, for instance, is hired, uh, I don't know, I think it's like 5% of, of the, the space that we work has all over the world. Why are they doing that? They're following talent, they just want to be the, in the hip move, or they want to be co-working, or the... Well, well but, but the, and, and I, Quincy has a question, I think others have questions as well, but, you know, the other thing that I left is, is how big is this space? I mean. Every everybody wants to do a, you know, you know shared workspace. That's the latest sort of trend in real estate. How many square feet are dedicated to this in South Florida or throughout the country? And to say American Express is at least five percent of WeWork's space worldwide. How big is that? Okay, uh, hold on. I've got too much. I don't know those numbers by heart, but I have my support today. Uh, how big is the office market in this country? It's twenty percent of the total real estate. Uh, how big in square feet is it? Um, <coughs> Come on, we did this in a due diligence class. I haven't taken that class. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you can tell us. That Tyler can tell us. Yeah, let me check my notes. <laughs> Quincy, while she's looking, what is your question? Mine was more of a comment. It sounds like the WeWork place is. They, they're doing like a gym membership type format where you get as much memberships as you can and you just hope not <coughs> come into the gym and work out at the same time. You got peak hours and then you got people like me that go work the, out at 1 o'clock. The, the memberships morning. vary in, in what you actually want. If you want to uh, go there like a two hours a day or, or just one day if you go to New York and you want to pay for that day, that's fine. If you want to use the space on a regular basis, you pay like $200 a month and you can go there and use their internet or it depends on the location and what your specific need is. If you require like a conference room, that's extra. If you require like a, you know, a, space, a small office for a meeting or something, that's different. They have different rates for different locations. Yeah, it just sounds like if everybody that has a membership at this WeWork come at the same time, they won't be able to support it. Just like a gym, like if everybody come with their membership and try to work out at the same time, you cheat. You can't get in the gym. Well, as I said, they go. They have to go by by the maximum occupancy of the physical space, okay? And they they assume that the thirty percent of the, the, the that the people those people are not going to show up, okay? Because and and I suppose they cross the information between the type of uh, membership or if you want to call it that they have. Okay. Hey, Irene is going to start setting up the presentation on. Um, on hotels. So.
Um, so that's why I think using a traditional cash flow model is is the best way to go uh, for the hospitality sector. Just a side note from the paper. Uh, some in the real estate industry and some in the hospitality industry consider hospitality the ugly sister of the real estate market, the real estate asset class. Because you really have to understand the, uh, the business per se uh, in order to make an investment decision or even to analyze it in a long term. So you can just, in my opinion, um, base your analysis on sales comparisons and characteristics of uh, the assets. So, moving on to my next slide, uh, historically there have been three different ways that people have valued hotels. Uh, and I think <coughs> we're discussing, when you talk about appraisal, uh, the income capitalization approach or discounted cash flow uh, is uh, based on the present worth of the future benefits. Um, the other one is a self-comparison approach and the other one is cost. Uh, the, the income approach, which I think is the most, uh, let's say, accurate or the most relevant and would give us more information, um, I support it because it, we can use more data, we can use more information and <coughs> in time uh, and make more assertive decisions. Um, and in any financial asset, whether it is a real estate or financial asset, um, the present value of the discounted cash flow of what the asset is generating is what we really care about. So um, that's the reason why income capitalization has been the most traditional one that's been used. The second approach is a sales comparison, which in my mind is the one that is more similar to the hedonic pricing model. Um, as we discussed before, it compares uh, um, something that's been sold for X price to something that's been sold to X price based on certain characteristics. But then again, why, why do people always quote hotel rooms on so much per door if they're really valuing the discounted cash flow? Well, uh, let me, if I'm going to go to the cost in a second, but let me answer that. Um, normally, it's based on the ADR. You can you generate uh, average daily exactly, rate. Sorry, exactly. Your average daily rate of a hotel is two hundred dollars. So what it tells me that I cannot pay more than two hundred thousand dollars per key. That's a rule of thumb in, in hospitality. So you you don't put the door, you you put the key. You know the the door. So is the the full the full cost of the door, it has to be, it's correlated to the income. So that, that, that property will command in the ADR is $200. So when you're analyzing a hotel and you're paying, let's say, $400 uh, per key, uh, $400,000 per key, and your average city rate is 180, you're, you're, you're losing money from the get-go. Uh, going back to that, a um, couple years back, I saw the property that we acquired at seven hundred dollars per key, and seven hundred thousand dollars per key, and we sold it at the record highest, best key ever paid by anybody. We sold it to Louis Vuitton in Saint Bart, and I cannot disclose the price per se, but I can tell you that they paid four thousand dollars a key. They have a plan that nobody understands, and they have something that probably nobody else can do because it's Louis Vuitton. Um, so, so, so you're saying people are really valuing hotel properties on the discounted cash flow on a, they just ultimately quote it back on a per key and there's obviously a relationship between what people can afford to pay and so that comparison is valid on a per door, per key basis because there's underlying economics that support that. Yes, and, and it gives you a good indication so you're, the first thing that you do when you do a, a, a we call it quick and dirt, is the per room key, how much it costs. So, and, and then we'll dig in, and again, uh, and I was gonna go that later, but let me bring it up right now. Um, 
when you're buying something that is underperforming. Uh, and you cannot buy on the first year <coughs> NOI and your capitalization rate, you project it because it's underperforming, so the cap rate or the capitalization on that year is not stabilized, you cannot use that. But you can predict using five years to stabilize the asset and uh, using a, a capitalization rate or a discount by the end of your whole period. Uh, and that will give you, uh, let me go when I, when I finish. But, um, so my sales comparison is very similar to the hedonic pricing. Uh, it's not used very much in, 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 uh, in hospitality. Uh, the cost, yes, the cost it gives me a great indicator when I want to do something, you know, quickly or when I'm analyzing uh, uh, development, for example. Um, how much it will cost me to build per door and how much it will be per door when I exit. Uh, and that's a, a quick approach. Uh, the, the, the one thing that the cost approach doesn't take into account is depreciation of the asset. The asset may be 20 years old, and the cost approach doesn't take that into account. Um, for example, you can use per door, but also you can do replacement cost. Uh, how much it would cost to replace the asset? That's a way to approach the cost. And um, if I'm looking at a property that is a historical property on Miami Beach, and I want to understand the cost and try to compare it to some, something else, maybe just the land is so invaluable, and you cannot replace again <coughs> the asset and put back the hotel into that place because it's historic. So it's an iconic property. Uh, so that's something that doesn't take into account, again, the cost of product. Um, so, uh, my, so what we suggest is the approach that is most used is the discounted cash flow model uh, and to the asset using what I said before, the income capitalization approach. Um, again, this is great if you if you buy a property that is already stabilized, you can uh, predict with the first year NOI and uh, use that as your, your starting point to benchmark what you're gonna pay for. Uh, but you also wanna uh, look at when and how and why are you gonna sell in the future? So you project five, three, or 10 years and the discounted cash flow gives you the opportunity to make decisions like hold, uh, sell, and refinance, and knowing when to sell. Uh, so an analyst or will always be updating the model every year, every quarter actually, every quarter, to look for uh, what's going on in the market, uh, if uh, the prices have changed also with the debt. Um, as you know, hotels you use debt like any other real estate asset, but the debt will, can bring down the cash flows, uh, but also if there's something ongoing with the NOI, the hotel, the hotel doesn't have normally a lease. Uh, the brand stopped doing that long, long, long ago and they uh, became operators uh, sold the operators and they sold the real estate to other company like uh, Intercontinental, the, uh, who's the largest operator in the world. Uh, so you don't have a lease, so it's, you cannot predict, you know, you're gonna receive X and over the next five years because the income is stream is, is stable uh, and you're gonna pay a debt of Y over X period of time uh, because again, here you vary upon uh, things that happens into the market. So um, this model gives a better perspective of when and how and your decisions with the asset, the decision that you have to do. Uh, so that's, um, and again, since hospitality is, uh, is, the, is a riskier uh, asset class, than, or is considered a riskier asset class than the other real estate asset class, using this cash flow model, uh, the discount cash flow model, gives you 
more ability to evaluate risk, in my opinion, than using anhedonic pricing models that normally are based on comparables and, and self Any questions? Uh, we're going to move on. If you just go to the previous, well, forget it. On the previous slide, we could spend, and I think in some of the asset class, especially office, I'd like to talk, touch on the fact that in today's environment, one of the justifications that people use for buying existing real estate is because it's, be, whoever wants to go next, start setting up, is, is because it's, it's being acquired below replacement cost. And so the question is, is you know, and, and, that's, and I'll leave it at that, it's something for you to com contemplate is if you can buy an existing asset, an existing cash flow at less than what it costs to develop, why would you ever develop? And under what scenario would you develop? And that's a reality today in most institutionally acquired, at least office space, potentially industrial. I don't know much about hospitality, most likely hospitality. It is much less expensive today to acquire real estate that is existing than it is to develop. So why are we in a development class? But that's just, that's just, you know, that just really talks to um, what's happening with construction materials, demand throughout the world, manpower, et cetera. So, you know, that's just a cycle now. There was a lot of building for a long time, and until, until there's a, a supply demand imbalance again and more demand than there is supply, you're going to see existing assets trading below replacement cost. So, Victor's article is on uh, multifamily. Victor, hold on, because I had problems following this chart. Okay, sorry. For what what specifically is this thing telling us on the left? Okay, it's telling us uh, the total population of the housing units. So, so you're saying there's 300, at the time that this was done, there's 303 million residents. Right, right. right so you're saying and that there are that. two thirds of those are known or occupied, and one third is in, in rental, which right. kind of correlates with what we said before. Right, right, okay. right, right, right. Okay, right. what's the balance of this stuff? Um, that seems to be a how long they've been in that residence. Right, so it's basically putting like a 10 year span of how many people moved in to these type of residence. Either moved in as in I'm buying my, my 